You're listening to The Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and today I am joined by Kathy Lorzell to talk about the reality of how curses, agreements, and vows show up in our stories. If these words sound strange to you, they will hopefully make much more sense as Kathy unpacks what we mean when we talk about a curse, an agreement, or a vow. For now, let me begin by saying that curses, agreements, and vows are real things that play out in very real ways in your day-to-day life, and they are rooted in particular places in your story. Thank you so much for listening. Here's my conversation with Kathy Lorzell. Kathy, it's good to see you. Hi, thanks for having me on, Adam. So say a little bit, just to introduce yourself about who you are, where you are geographically, and what you spend your time doing with the Allender Center. Well, I am the executive vice president of the Allender Center and founded it with Dan and Becky about, oh, I don't know, 11 years ago now. Um, Officially 10 years. We're on the brink of 10 years. And I spend my days uh, overseeing the Allender Center, but also uh, developing a lot of the training and curriculum and writing and and really fleshing out Dan's methodology and theory to be able to translate that um, into the next generations. If listeners want to engage their story in more depth, I've mentioned the Allender Center before, but now that we have, you know, the head of it on the line, I thought... Let's spend just a few minutes um, making a pitch for Start With Story Workshop. Story Workshop is one of the Allender Center offerings. Listeners who are interested in engaging your story in more depth, that's a a great place to start. So can you say a little bit about what it is, who should attend, how someone should make a decision about whether they should go to the Story Workshop? So our theory is that you can't take anyone further than you're willing to go yourself. And so we also believe uh, really passionately that the way to healing is through uh, going back into parts of your story that you don't currently um, understand or is kind of haunting you or places that you don't even realize are impacting how you relate to the world and others. So the story workshop is a great baseline to start to, to learn some of that theory around why we believe that story matters and why story uh, exploring your story ends up being really the the place that will catapult you into more healing and connection with God. Um, and during the story workshop, you get to learn under Dan Allender and some of the team. And then you also do individual or group story work um, in group settings. And so you get to bring a story that you write and then um, our team of facilitators engages you in that story. And it's a pretty profound experience for most people. Um, if you're on the fence around our theory or or uh, I know Adam's talked about the U theory on this podcast, a lot of that gets played out into the st- uh, through the story workshop. So this next one coming up is in April in Chicago, and I think there's still some slots left. Um, But it's a great way to enter into this and to figure out if story work is part of your healing journey. And then in addition to the story workshop, if folks have done that or if they're wanting, let's say, a bigger baptism into all of this material, there's the uh, recently renamed Certificate in Narrative Focused Trauma Care. Yes. What is that program? Who's it for? What does it involve? So that program, as Adam said, is a bit more intensive, um, but it allows you to do a bit more deep dive both into your own story and also how do you bring this work to the work you're doing uh, in your context. So pastors, therapists, uh, we actually have a lot of doctors and nurses that are coming on who want to learn more about how trauma impacts the heart and the soul and how do you develop a theology around trauma and how do you actually step into your own life to heal harm but then also learn how to step into the lives of others. So we have a wide range of people doing this program. It's it's over four four four-day weekends during the year, and they travel to Seattle. Uh, So it's it's a bit more of a commitment, but it's truly life-changing. You get a glimpse into this world um, without necessarily having to go get your PhD or your master's in psychology. And so, again, there are people who come who... uh, 
are already have their masters and and are are practicing clinicians and it's a, a fabulous way to learn how to do trauma focused narrative therapy but also practitioners who are just uh, doing day in and day out running small groups working in their churches people who just care about other people who need more training it's a pretty as i said profound experience for most people who are involved in it and and it really blends well the combination of kind of didactic teaching of information that's necessary for understanding just how we operate as human beings and particularly as a result of our family of origin and group engagement with your own personal story listening to other people engage your story particularly the the facilitator who's well trained skilled entering into and encouraging you inviting you to go to places in your story that you may not even know are places to visit uh, it's where I first learned about the importance of my story. Um, I, I can say hands down, just personally, I could not do the work that I do as a therapist without the training that I received at the Allender Center. Graduate school is, I would say, a necessary 20%, but it's only 20%. I mean, what I've learned um, through the Allender Center, it, 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 I mean, I couldn't do what I do without it. And so deeply indebted to, especially you, Kathy, for codifying uh, some of the brilliant uh, words and approaches and insights of, of Dan's um, in a way that is digestible and can be metabolized and, and made really practical. So let's shift to today's topic. Today, we're going to focus on how evil assaults the human heart through curses, agreements, vows, and soul ties. And if those words sound a bit abstract and weird right now, uh, by the end of the episode, they will hopefully make much more sense. The only reason uh, that we're talking in such detail about how evil attacks our hearts is because at the end of the day, there's nothing abstract about these categories. They are very concrete. Uh, they're very in storied and they're very real. Uh, but before we begin, just a disclaimer, there's no way to do this subject justice in a podcast episode or even a series of podcast episodes. So again, after listening, if you're eager to go deeper, uh, really want to encourage you to check out the offerings at the Allender Center, as particularly the certificate program dives into these categories uh, with much more specificity and depth than we're going to be able to do today. So today's thesis, which I first learned from you, Kathy, is that the strategy of evil is to curse us so that we will make an agreement, so that we will make a vow, so that we will become bound to the person who cursed us via a soul tie. In other words, there's a progression from curses to agreements to vows to soul ties. But let's begin with curses. What is a curse the way we're talking about it today? So from my perspective, a curse is something that is created by evil to do us harm, to take us down. But it's very specific to, um, to our stories. So a curse is meant to derail and defile something of your inherent goodness or gifting. And it's often a result of something in you that is sweet, good, beautiful, that creates envy in another and must be harmed or taken out in order for the people around you to be able to bear the goodness that we automatically reflect of God. Okay, time out, time out. You, you, you've just said so much. And the, and the thing I'm, I'm lingering with right off the bat is that it's something good. Yes. yes. Say a bit more about... The, the relation, how can a curse be about something good in, in my heart? Yeah. So oftentimes uh, what's true about us, especially when we're young, is that we reflect something automatically of the goodness and the beauty of God. Uh, that's that's how we're born. We, we're born in a way that we we want to bring life. We want to connect to our parents. We want to connect to the world and the way we were meant to. And that is a powerful force to bring into the world. We're also born into families that have spent a lot of time on this earth that have been shattered. 
um, people who have been harmed, people who have lost their innocence and naivete. And oftentimes the goodness of a child is very difficult for a family to bear. And so when I think about curses, it's often the place where you're most specifically created to bear the glory of God that is too much for the people around you to bear, and they have to take it down a notch. Um, and it's not all cruel or, or even um, an evil intention that's, that's known off the bat. I think it's a place where goodness is really difficult for us to bear when we've been in this world long enough to have been battered by it. And I think the way we handle that and, and degrees will be different depending on the dysfunction of your family, the harm of your family. Um, you know, if you have extremely uh, harmful, abusive parents, the cursing will be very intense um, because they'll need to somehow satiate something of what they've come to know of the world and and take you down to their level. If I'm hearing you right, there's a sense in which the beauty and glory of this seven-year-old girl exposes yes. some of the decisions that the parents have made to harden their hearts. Absolutely. And in that exposure, envy is evoked. Oftentimes, curses come from envy. And so, again, when, when you see the life of a child, the innocence, the hope, and you're living in a place where you have lost that hope, you've made the decision or your own vow to, to step away from that hope and the world has, has worn you down over time, then, then you will evoke that envy and, and then create a curse for that child. So it, it can be sometimes as, as drastic as you know, long-term harm, harmful verbiage around how stupid you are or how naive you are or just wait till the world you know, gets you, you'll see, you'll know what I know, that sort of thing. Or it can be very subtle, like, oh, stop being a drama queen. You know, so there are severity levels that can be true for a curse, but I think we always want to look at curses as the place where envy has come to bear and where something of evil has has joined the envy and the heartbreak of your parents or other people around you to be able to to take you down a notch um, and embed something in you or over you that is very difficult not to come to believe eventually. A curse doesn't always have to come through a parent, but no, uh, e e evil can speak directly. More often than not, uh, it is strategic to speak curses through someone else, particularly through a primary attachment figure like a mom or a dad. Why? Because the nature of being a child is that you are deeply impressionable by the words of your mother and father. Um, and so I think oftentimes the curses that come to us come through people that are important to us. Absolutely. Uh, and that's by the design of evil. We are created to take on the naming of our parents. We're created to take on their blessing. And, and sadly, the flip side of that is that we take on their cursing. And so let's let's take an example let me throw an example out there and just get you to comment com comment on it a middle school girl just had a bad day at school two of her friends have turned on her she's devastated she's feeling betrayed and she takes the risk and she tells her mom about it that night at bedtime uh, and mom turns to her and contemptuously says honey you're so dramatic it's not really that big a deal just find some other friends is that a curse? And if so, why? Mm -hmm. so that's a great example. So I, I love that example because it's so common. And, and I think when we talk about spiritual warfare, oftentimes we end up making it seem, um, you know, extreme and, uh, you know, back to like Frank Peretti's, uh, um, you know, books and, and, but you're, but you're right. I mean, that, that's a very common scene in most homes. And, and how do we concretize that? How do we encode that as kids? Yes, I would say it's a curse. I think it's a curse because it's a mother trying to, to fix something of her daughter's broken heart, her tender heart. And my guess is that that mom doesn't have a whole lot of room for her own tenderness, 
her own brokenness, her own broken heart. And so in one way, she's trying to, quote unquote, protect her daughter by hardening her up and 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 preparing her for a world that the mom knows she cannot escape. On the other hand, she's not actually tending to this precious daughter's heartbroken um, story around girls turning on her, her friends turning on her. And so I think you have a choice in that moment as a mom to be able to overcome something of your own heart that has not been tended to. And if you can do that, you can actually um, forego the invitation to curse. You can actually bless. But in that moment, for that mom to say that, she's giving in to something of her own heartbrokenness and her own hardening that's now uh, saying to her daughter, be like me. Um, oftentimes curses are a way to join someone else and and bring that daughter back into the world that that mom thinks is true. And so again, it reminds me of your point earlier that curses often land in places of immense goodness and glory because this this hypothetical girl is sensitive. She's a deep feeler. And evil is not fond of that unique way in, in which she reflects uh, the, the depth of feeling of God and of, of Christ. And so uh, she is being assaulted in precisely the area of her beauty. Yeah, and that's so true for most curses, right? So if you if you arc out even a more of an imagination for for this this young girl, that sense that she has had, you know, deep friendships that have brought her to a place where she could be impacted in this way, which could bring jealousy up for the mom. Um, there's something that she's been she's been accepted, she's been brought in, she's been loved by other people outside of her relationship with her mom, right? So you can, you, when you start to unpack it, and that's why story work is so important, because even just naming that as a curse, the detail of why that curse was spoken in that moment becomes really important in terms of how you then carry that forward after that, that time. So that 13-year-old then ends up in one of our story groups 10, 15, 20 years later, and that little girl, that that little girl who's now a woman, doesn't understand why her heart has turned so much against her own tenderness and beauty. So let's transition because we're already kind of you can't help yourself. We're we're moving. Uh, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're moving from what happens in the heart in the wake of a curse. So on her bed, even that night, in that moment, when we are cursed, something inside us joins. Mm -hmm. And an agreement is a joining with the curse. Why do we join and what's an agreement? Well, let's go back to, to this girl. So, she, so again, she, like you said, she's laying in her bed. And now what does she do? She has one world that is telling her that her own heart, the part of her that is, that is so connected to a deep part of God's goodness and tenderness that wants to believe there's a different option. But she's young and her, as you said before, primary attachment figures are the ones that are going to influence us more than anything else to show us what's true about the world. And so she's, she's in this tender spot and now her heart has to choose. Do I choose to join with my mother and then at least I have her? Or do I choose to uh, join something of, of this ethereal sense that there's more to this than just closing my heart off? Well, you can understand and have so much empathy for that girl to know she's in an impossible bind now. Um, how does she choose knowing that her friends just turned on her? And so now some of her only solace that she'll have are, is in the arms of her mother. Um, so for her not to join her mother in that moment and believe that she's being dramatic, right? Her mom's giving her a way out of her heartbreak. And in that sense, curses can become so confusing because in some ways they're a gift, in that moment, she gets to have a different alternative than being just sad and realizing the betrayal of these friends. Um, and if she holds on to the betrayal of the friends, she's now also going to have to have to handle something of the betrayal of her mother because her mother has now asked her to turn on her own heart as well. And let's remember, she's 12 or 13 years old. Right. Yes. And if that's true, this isn't the first time that that sort of curse has come up. 
by the time a 12 or 13 year old is experiencing that sort of cursing, you have to know that there's something of envy of hardening that's been asked of her prior to that point. That wouldn't just come out of the blue of a mom. That that's part of how that mother sees the world, which is, you know, toughen up and get over it and don't cry and let's just make it better. That's that's going to have been true from the moment that little girl was born. And so on her bed, faced with this, uh, what I would call a choiceless choice, she makes an agreement. And what is the agreement? My mom's right. I need to harden up. I need to toughen up. I'm just going to pull myself up. Not that this is about my mom and my family, but um, we were big musical theater fans when I was a kid. And there was this song in South Pacific that said I was going to wash that man right out of my hair. It's a great show, but, you know, it's about I'm just going to get over it. And and that was the posture that my family had towards heartbreak was just wash that man right out of your hair and start all over again. And and that's in some ways a playful thing, a, a way to build resiliency ish. And it, it was something that really uh, Im- embedded itself in my psyche where I'm still trying to recover from that. None of us escape it and we make choices around how we're then going to encode that into how we live the rest of our lives. And so to agree with that is to say, yeah, not only is it true that the world is harsh and I need to learn how to deal with it, but now I have a way to deal with it by denying something of my own heartache and my tenderness and denying grief and going straight to um, to the other side. Like, I'm fine. I can handle it. And and again, the mom may believe she's trying to build resiliency, but that is directly based out of her wounding. She's now transferring that onto her daughter and her daughter now has, and like you said, an impossible decision where do I now believe that my mom knows more than me, which is part of the safety we need to feel with attachment figures, right? So for her at that moment of 13 to to create a different option for herself would be to deny her mom's authority, deny her mom's bigness, her capacity to care for her. And, and to some degree, that's an existential crisis that most of us aren't ready to do at that age. Right. And so something in her heart agrees, I'm too dramatic. I'm too sensitive. Right. That sends her on a trajectory that then will shift something of how she now knows her own heart. So before moving on to uh, vows, what we've done so far is we've looked at how this curse leads to an agreement. Another curse. Uh, Why can't you be more like your brother and not be so needy all the time? This is just hypothetical. I'm just making this up. Why can't you be more like your brother and not be so needy all the time? Uh, You know, dad says to the, the, the youngest of the two brothers and that that brother is going to agree I'm too needy or a curse can look at look look like you're so abrasive no one is going to respond to you when you talk to them with that tone of voice yeah and and again you notice in all of your examples there's such a key part of people's tenderness and and the part of their heart that's so vulnerable that's being directly attacked that also brings such a specific part of the beauty and goodness of God to bear. And, and you'll notice that in all of that, even the the girl that you talked about in the, the first one, the 13 year old, you're don't be so dramatic, right? The, but that's attacking the tenderness of her heart and her capacity to feel grief of betrayal, right? You're training her to ignore that. And you're asking her to agree with it, which then she turns on her own heart. So again, if evil can get into you at that level when you're that young through a curse and then you agreeing with it, you now have a tie to something that says that which I am most meant for goodness is now shown as something of weakness, something of um, that needs to be overcome. You know, so so the other things of, of the neediness of the little boy, well, that's a boy who longs for love longing for connection, longing for um, the, the, the goodness and the attention of a father, of a mother, and that isn't available in their home. So the dad then says, 
you know, why can't you be more like the one who's already agreed with us yes. that this is the way our family is? Yes. And so now you have a son set up to turn on his own need and shut down. Um, and then you wonder why 15, 20 years from now he's in a marriage counseling, not being able to tend to his own needs or the needs of his wife and his children. And so the, the flip side of this is that looking at your story to find curses can actually be rather fun because it will introduce you to your glory. It will introduce you to some of the most beautiful parts of who God has made you to be. Find the curse and you'll find your glory. Yes. Evil is really smart in the sense that that why not go after the places that are most glorious, most tender, right? That will bring the most healing, the most redemption to the world. Why not take that out at its knees and early age and harden your heart in a way that then brings less capacity for you to love, to love others, to love God, to be receptive. We are designed to be tender. Um, we're designed to have delicate parts of us that need that need to be seen, that need to be tended to, that need to be loved. And those are the parts that evil just snuffs out uh, really early on. And, and how brilliant of it, really, <laughs> to go after those places, because those are the hardest to rebuild. But it's also uh, like I love I love the idea of it being fun as as I've looked back in my own life and understood both where there have been cursing whether it's intentional or unintentional, and then knowing where I've agreed with it, as I step back into those stories, my stories, the stories of others, there is such sweet redemption when you realize part of my glory is my tenderness. And tenderness is often not seen as glory, especially in our culture, especially for men, um, that those are parts that we really do not see the the tenderness, the 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 goodness of Jesus in the midst of, of those parts of our own hearts. Envy is also a massive part of, of why curses come to be, as we said. And so as you look at what is envied in you, it's what has the most threat to evil. Glory, beauty, gifting, those are all the places that you are the most threat to evil and can offer the most goodness to the world. And if you are listening out there and thinking no one has envied, no one has ever envied anything about me, you're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah. Envy in many ways drives so many of the dynamics that result in how we relate to other people. And it often works outside of our awareness because we know our own insides and we think if they knew me they wouldn't envy me so it would behoove you to begin to think about and even get a piece of paper and write down where might you have been envied as a girl or a boy it's a great question as you step into some of those stories because of how quickly evil snuffs it out you may have to go deep. <laughs> I don't know very many kids uh, who aren't looking up at their primary attachment figure and bringing something of joy and elation and trust. But imagine for someone who has like a mother who maybe has struggled her whole life with um, the idea of her being loved or lovable, now all of a sudden is looking at a baby who is trusting her so fully, and now she's coming face to face with the fact that she's actually loved in a way that she never thought possible, but it's also coming straight up against any sort of agreements she's made in her life around why she's not lovable too. If you don't believe in God as a creator and you don't believe that there's beauty in each of us, then this isn't going to make any sense to you. But if we actually believe that God has created us to be image bearers, then we have beauty and goodness and gifting in each one of us. And if part of our story is that we don't believe that's true or that other people envy that, that means that the work of evil has been a part of your life from the very beginning in very profound ways. 
I haven't shared much of my story on this podcast, but I'm going to share a little story of a of a curse, um, and then maybe we can just reflect on it together, Kathy. Yeah. When I was in seventh to eighth grade, I was relentlessly made fun of for shaving my legs. I didn't shave my legs. I wasn't a swimmer. I just didn't have a lot of hair on them. And a rumor started and I froze and didn't fight back and didn't stop it. Um, and it got completely out of control. And, you know, like middle schools are, um, when you see somebody who's uh, susceptible to mockery, it's easy to join in. And so I, I, this got way out of control and my parents finally took me to a psychiatrist. And I was so hopeful that the professional psychiatrist man would be able to help me. Um, So I told him about the teasing at school and I felt, you know, how I felt utterly humiliated, powerless to make it stop. His name was Dr. Raymond and he listened to me and my parents were there. The three of us were sitting, uh, me, my parents and Dr. Raymond. He listened to me um, and then he said, Adam, I see a lot of kids who have divorced parents or who have a parent with a terminal illness or who have a sibling that got hit by a car and died. Those kids have problems. You don't have problems. Ugh. In this case, the curse came from the professional psychiatrist man, but my parents were right there tacitly agreeing with him. They, they didn't say anything. And in the wake of that curse, those kids have problems. You don't have problems. I made an agreement. I, I remember it. I mean, I, I, this was decades and decades ago, something inside of me said, I don't have problems. My problems aren't that bad. My story is not that bad. I shouldn't be hurting inside as much as I am. Mm -hmm. And what did that tell your young heart? Well, it threw me into a massive war with my heart because I was filled with anxiety and dread every day when I went to school. But if I'm feeling all these feelings inside and I don't have any real problems, then I must be crazy or making it up. Right. So it, it, it was absolutely torturous. Yeah. I would imagine, I mean, given that I know a little bit of your story, that it also set you up in the sense of, of what some of your natural proclivity is, which is your sensitivity, your capacity to see other people, to understand betrayal, you know, now all of a sudden that's seen as dramatic and an over an exaggeration and, you know, needy or, um, taking up space that is, should actually be reserved for people who have real problems. Yes. So immediately your heart turns on itself. And that's what happened sitting in that black chair in his office. And I, and, and I also want to emphasize that oftentimes, I don't think always, but oftentimes curses come in moments of immense hope. Oh, gosh. So I was so hopeful sitting in that chair that he was going to be able to tell me something to make this stop. The girl in our story earlier is so helpful that mom is going to be able to tell her something to make the bad thing stop happening. Yes. Yes. So you're vulnerable. Vulnerable and and innocent and hopeful. Yes. And I think hopefulness is such an open position. So your arms, you're not protected. You're not waiting for the blow. You're not suspicious of what's going to come next. You actually feel like there's there's the potential uh, to be seen and to experience rest and comfort. Yes, yes. And curses are the worst when they come at that level because your heart is is like a river that just flows directly into something of your being and your soul. And it just has direct access to a vein. It just goes directly in and it's re- and those are the, the hard blows. I mean, curses that come from people who you don't really care about, where you're protected, where you're feeling defended, you know, that's that it doesn't penetrate. It doesn't it doesn't deep dive into something where you're now saying, wow, this is part of who I am. Or how could I be so foolish as to believe there could be comfort? And so Again, that naturally brings us into the vow. 
Right. So let's transition. How does curse lead to agreement lead to vow? If the curse is the thing that comes against you, that you are vulnerable to, that you take in and agree with it, then you almost have no choice but to figure out how to defend yourself from the thing that you now fear. So if for that girl, if she takes in, I'm dramatic and I just need to get over it and she agrees, then her automatic vow is going to be something around the lines of, I'm not going to be susceptible to this sort of harm again. I'm going to harden my heart and not be impacted. So she goes cold. She toughens up. Um, No one's going to get in and I'm not going to be impacted. That's the vow. So that girl, that woman shows up in your church, in your small group, and she looks like she has it all together and isn't easily impacted by anyone around, but also like is really put together. Well, chances are there's some sort of curse agreement vow that's come to play where she's had to decide this is a new orientation I now have to life because I've now learned that this thing is true and I need to protect myself from it. And vows will feel, as, as you get close to them, to putting words to them, it, it won't feel like a vow. It will feel like this is just the way the world is. Yes. And this is what I've had to do to survive. And that's why vows have to be honored to some degree. If you get to a vow, you start to understand, oh, gosh, this is a thing that's true because of a curse, because of an agreement. You made that vow in order to stay safe in an unsafe world. That was your best attempt to how to reorient yourself so you weren't so vulnerable. You know, so Adam, you being in that chair, you had to make a decision in that moment of how you were going to protect yourself from ever feeling that level of betrayal again. Like there's something in you that has to decide how to survive and how not to have your heart broken over and over and over and over again. And I don't fault anyone for doing that. I think vows are a way we do survive those moments. The problem comes when now we're adults, we're in healthier relationships, we're in different circumstances. Those vows now set us up for isolation and not being able to be connected in the way that our hearts are actually meant for delight and goodness. And so we have to honor the vow, not just rip it away from ourselves. And there has to be a tremendous amount of grief of what would have needed to take place in order for that vow to become a centralized position in your psyche. Those those are pretty extreme circumstances to, to have been harmed in that way to then say, I will not be vulnerable to other people's harm. I'm going to I'm going to become tough. I'm going to become hard. Um, and for to some degree, vows work for you for a season. And they become what we call your personality. Right. But it's not. But here's the here's the deal. It couldn't be further from your real personality. That's right. But it is sadly a big part of the person that you present to the outside world. And by outside world, I mean your spouse, your coworkers, uh, your children. And, and, and yet, it is actually, in many ways, 180 degrees removed from that tender, sensitive heart of that girl who was a deep feeler as a, as a 12, 13-year-old um, until she began to harden it so that she could survive the rest of middle school and frankly, so that she could survive her mother. Right. Yeah. And now you start to, to talk about soul ties. Before we get there, just summarize, if you will. Um, well, let me summarize it. You tell me if this fits. A curse comes from a person who names you in a way that harms and destroys. An agreement is where you come to own the curse as true of your heart. You join the curse. You agree with it. And then a vow is when you declare a way to protect your heart from future harm. Say a bit more about how vows become part of what we think of as our personality. 
let me take a step back just for a second. The reason why we believe so fully in the idea that you have to go back to origin stories is because I don't think you can truly understand why you are the way you are right now without being able to understand what got you to this place. What stories of harm took place that started for you to start to orient yourself to the world differently according to how harm has particularly taken hold in your life. And, and for us, when we do story work, we're always talking about the particularity. So even going back to the story of the 13 year old, the particularity of how her mother saw her, saw herself, how that played out in their home for a long time is going to be the particular way that she takes or, or creates a vow. So there can be lots of moments that have the same sort of theme around friends who turn on you and then you go home and and talk about it. Like for me, when I had friends turn on me in sixth grade, um, you know, I went home and told my mom and there there was a sense of of you, you need to kind of pull yourself up. But it was more a sense of let's make you feel better. Let's go to the mall and get a new outfit. Let's go to your favorite restaurant and, you know, get something that will make you feel better. And so, again, that's the same archetypal story of the of the friends who turn on you. But depending on who your mother is and how you have already been developed at that point, that will shift as to what sort of vow you're making. And so I think it's really important for us to start to look deeper into the particularity of what it meant for us to be in our homes in order for us to then understand and make the link between who we are now. And it's really as we deep dive into the specific stories that we start to to gain clarity on to how it's impacted and how it relates. So like that's my story. So when my son came home in his third day of kindergarten, having had something tragic happen, my impulse is to try to make him feel better. Right. Right. Yep. And that's directly related to how I learned how to make myself feel better. So I had to override something of that because of the healing that I've I've gone through and the story work I've done over the last 15 years in order to actually be able to tend to his heart and help him not make new vows that are like my vows. And the biblical word for that is repentance. That's right. You can't repent apart from story. Yes, because you don't know what you're repenting from. You, you don't. And and what's wrong with, with comforting my son uh, by saying, hey, let's get an ice cream cone. I mean, repentance gets at God is interested in getting at the core of the dynamics of our heart. And you something in you because of the work you had done realized in that moment, I, I have a choice about how I respond to this boy. Yes. And my son has a very, very tender heart who is very impacted, very empathetic. And he wanted to avoid the shame, the humiliation. It was too much for his little heart to bear. And I needed to bring every faculty, every healed faculty that I have to bear on behalf of him to help him mitigate that shame and that humiliation um, in a way that helped him go through it, helped him move through it, helped him move through the emotions of it without then for him to not turn on his own tender heart and and toughen up something of his own body and soul in order to be able to like go back to school the next day. But and I think that's why this work matters, because if you can actually break those vows in a way that brings grief and tenderness to how you've suffered, you can actually break the generational curses and ties that so often are not addressed because we don't have enough knowledge of how they got there in the first place. That was a great sentence or run on sentence. There's so much in there. And, and what what I hope you're hearing, listeners, is how much power you have as a parent, um, if you are one, to break 
the strategic assault of evil against your intergenerational family. Yes. And the way you begin to deploy that power is by engaging your story. There is nothing you can do on behalf of your children more than engage your story. Oh, amen. I mean, don't you think that's true for your life, Adam? It's unequivocally true. I, I mean, yep. I, I see it all the time with my, I have an 11 year old daughter, uh, an almost nine year old son. And I, I see when my son is whining, when he's whining, when he's throwing himself on the ground, whining, every fiber of my being, something comes up and says, I want to say sentences like, you have no idea how good you have it. Uh, the only way that that's not my posture towards him is because of the grief that I've been able to do with regard to my own story. I mean, period, period. Yeah, that's true for me too. There's no way that I could have done what I did with Liam if I hadn't had part of my own story come to bear and and grieving that. And even with that, it took everything I had to to not recreate a familial system. Um and and it was actually quite shocking to to feel like oh gosh this is still hard even though i know all the right things to do and i think i i because of that i have so much compassion for anyone stepping into this work and trying to stop something of generational sin generational shame generational cursing and i have so much compassion for our hearts that long for redemption but it is hard work. There's so much hope in the midst of it, but it is, it's hard. And it means going back to places that we would rather let, um, just be buried under the sand. Redemption doesn't work that way. Um, you have to go deep into those buried places in order to really find resurrection and redemption. And that is very countercultural for us especially within Christianity, uh, you, the idea that you have to go back in order to go forward and to know God is, is not something that we often submit ourselves to. Yeah. And this is the genius, I think, of your U diagram. Your U diagram is exposing the unchristian fallacy of somehow being able to jump from the crucifixions of Friday to the dancing with Jesus, everything's fine, I'm a great mom or dad of Sunday, with, without dipping down into the particular heartaches of our stories when we were on a bed as a 12-year-old or in a psychiatrist's office as a 13-year-old. These are the stories that have shaped the deepest recesses of our hearts out of which we parent and love our spouses and relate to our coworkers. Absolutely. It's all interconnected. And without access to those origin stories, um, you're just recreating a system that doesn't have any hope of changing. Before we end, say a bit about, okay, I see some of the curses or I see a curse. I see an agreement. I see a vow. What do I do? I don't know what you do without actually allowing your heart to settle somewhere in the midst of the story. And even if you can't see a therapist or you can't come to a story workshop or a certificate program, you can dip into that story with a spouse, with a friend, in a journal. And there is healing to be had just by telling the story, getting yourself back into that room, going back onto the bed, sitting at that dining room table when you allow yourself to go back to where it started, it may feel like it's going to feel like death, but it actually feels so there's so much relief and heartache and grief as you actually allow your heart to settle in the midst of it. So I would say, you know, you have to tell the story again. If you don't have a spouse who you feel safe with or friends, if you're so isolated, write it, write the story um, Jesus can meet you there and then really ask, ask the Lord, ask you know, something of the spirit to enter in to help you tell more of the truth than you've ever told before. 
And if there's anything I could plead with you about, it's that your stories deserve a witness. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, when I think about people who are isolated out there who don't have someone who could be a kind and good witness to your story, it breaks my heart. I know that's true. And what I want to like pray for and ask Jesus is, is like, is there one person that maybe you haven't even found yet that you can seek out who can be someone to be a witness to your story? Um, because it's, it's in our stories being witnessed that we are actually able to have our faces seen, our stories read. We are not meant to do this work alone. Um, there's a reason why even God is the Trinity because there's relationship and we, we are not meant to be alone. And so to have a witness, to have a community of witnesses, and that's so much of what we're trying to do at the Allender Center is build a community of people who can be witness to one another's story um, outside of the walls in Seattle, that this goes far beyond what we're doing here. And we're, we're wanting to, to create spaces where people know how to do that well and care for one another and believe that that's the best way that we can join the work of the kingdom, um, at least in this age. This is, as I said at the beginning, uh, incredibly unfinished, uh, certainly not an exhaustive treatment of this incredibly important topic, but it has been a lovely start. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, you're welcome, Adam. Thanks again for having me on. It's a pleasure. Okay, thank you so much for listening. We did not get to talk about soul ties in today's episode, nor did we have time to address how one goes about breaking curses, agreements, and vows. So we will examine both of these topics in the next episode when Kathy comes back and joins me to discuss soul ties and to discuss breaking uh, all these things. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time. <laughs>